a college English professor. I work with young readers transitioning to become adult readers. It's a job I love despite knowing the old joke. Question, what's the difference between an English major and a park bench? Answer, a park bench can support a family of four. <laughs> When working with these college students, I use literature to deepen and expand the range of their thinking. But what about the students I never get, because they never graduated high school, who fell through the cracks in an overcrowded, underfunded school system, who gradually dropped behind bit by bit until they became convinced they'd never catch up, who came to tell themselves, I don't like reading because they'd never learned to suck a novel's sweet juice. Those are the ones reading power is saving student by student while there's still time. Reading power teaches them that reading is power and reading is pleasure too. I'll say just a bit about the three important ways that reading transforms a child emotionally, cognitively, and spiritually. First, literature educates our emotions. For while we think our emotions are perfectly clear and accessible and transparent, that's very rarely the case, even for adults. It's hard work to know what we're feeling. But reading not only helps us feel better, reading helps us feel better. Literature develops our emotional intelligence and prepares us imaginatively to comprehend and master life's events. Through reading, we entertain choices and perceive consequences. A story presents us with a plot, which is to say an event linked causally to another event, the and then, and then, and then of narrative suspense. Neuroscientist Susan Greenfield suggests that reading helps expand kids' attention spans because stories have a beginning, middle, and end, she says. A structure that encourages our brains to think in sequence, to link cause, effect, and significance. It is essential to learn this skill as a small child while the brain has more plasticity. Some people think reading is an escape. I think it's an escape that ultimately returns us back to ourselves as wiser and more experienced feelers. The emotional intelligence nurtured by reading can be leaned on in times of hardship and stress, not uncommon situations for the low-income areas that reading power tutors. But University of Sussex researchers show just six minutes of reading can slash stress by two-thirds. Writer Linda Berry puts it this way, we use stories to stand and understand what otherwise would be intolerable. What powerful medicine is found between the covers of a book? The second thing I want to mention is that literature deepens us cognitively as well as emotionally. The emerging field of literary neuroscience shows that brain activity during engaged reading is more global than previously understood. When we read, a number of different brain areas are firing. For example, if you read a passage about a character running through the woods, the brain's frontal cortex, the frontal lobe's motor cortex, lights up 
in the same way it would as if you were actually running. Simply stated, our reading brains simulate real experiences which does not happen when you're watching TV or playing computer games. Reading is the original virtual reality. <laughs> One of the most important things Reading Power does is provide children actual books on actual paper to take home and read with their families. This, to my mind, is a very big part of Reading Power's success story because some of those children have been taught early on to rely on screens as pacifiers and babysitters. The good news is that, if caught early enough, children can develop more complex neural pathways. Poor readers who are trained to become better readers have a resulting change in the volume of white matter in the language area of their brains. Cognitive neuroscientist Mary Ann Wolf discusses how today's children, digital natives, are so used to screens bombardment of stimuli that they develop what she calls continuous partial attention. This is a different quality of attention than that which allows a reader to weigh relevant details of a story and allocate time to consolidate them. Non-book reading children develop less complex brain circuitry, which leads them, as adults, to retreat to the simplest, least dense, most familiar sources of information. This, in turn, leads them to be vulnerable to demagoguery and fake news. <laughs> the ramifications are staggering. Wolf puts it this way, the atrophy and gradual disuse of our analytic and reflective capabilities are the worst enemies of a truly democratic society. Literature deepens our thinking, not because it provides answers, but because it clears space for reflection. Think for a minute about the pre-K through second graders that Reading Power targets. They were born into a world that more than ever does not encourage reflection. Their world encourages consumption. Their world rewards speed. Their world is not asking them these questions. Did you create today? Did you contemplate today? Did you practice kindness? Their world is preparing them for this question. Confirm purchase? As we've learned to rely more and more on near instantaneous technology, we've grown less comfortable with reflection. Perhaps if Robert Frost was writing today, he'd write, whose woods these are, I think I'll Google. <laughs> Consider the power of taking a child proficient in continuous partial attention and pairing that child with the continuous undivided attention of a tutor. A tutor like the brand new two-week-old tutor, my mother, Marianne Amolish. <laughs> A tutor who will spend 35 minutes strengthening the circuitry of the brain needed for critical analysis. That child will later be better prepared to ask the big questions, like who we are and what we're doing here on Earth. And that child will be better able to observe clearly, which is a moral obligation. For only when we observe clearly can we think clearly. And only when we think clearly can we speak and write clearly. And only when we speak and write clearly can we change the world. 
The third thing that literature does is enlarge us spiritually. We find ourselves when we lose ourselves in a book. There's a balm to be had when we recognize our experiences in the lives of characters. Hey you, out there, what is your fear? What is your shame? What is your secret that can't be born? Read enough books and you'll find a companion. James Baldwin puts it this way, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world. And then you read. <laughs> I've already mentioned that when we read, the brain does not make a real distinction between reading about an experience and actually living it. When we read about a character, we inhabit him or her, and thus develop empathy. In a recent study, children were shown photographs cropped to reveal only a subject's eyes, and they were asked to guess the subject's emotions. Children who were readers more accurately identified the subject's emotions. The researchers theorized that reading allows us to practice taking another's perspective and therefore improves social awareness. Learning to imagine someone else's story and feelings combats the intolerance, fundamentalism, and violence that compromise our greatness. We need empathy, lest we see the other, as Marilyn Robinson has said, as sinister rather than a piece of the many voices that make it democratic society. Friends, Frederick Douglass said, it is easier to build strong children than repair broken men. It is easier to build strong children than repair broken men. It is easier and it's cheaper. <laughs> It only costs $2,000 for reading power to transform a non-reader into a reader to permanently change the wiring of that child's brain. Think about what $2,000 could buy you in worldly goods and weigh that against the world of good you do by strengthening a child emotionally, cognitively, and spiritually. I'd like to end with a story. Yesterday, I was packing my suitcase to come here, and my middle child, Thomas, came into the room, and he said, you know, Mom, why are you going? Do you really have to go? And I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm giving a talk. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about the importance of, of early childhood literacy, and I'm, I'm gonna try to, to raise some support for these, these kids who aren't good readers. And he said, you know, why? Why aren't they good readers? What's wrong? Are they dyslexic? And I said, you know, no, no, not necessarily, you know? And um, he, he really wanted to know. So I, I stopped shoving my socks into my boots and, you know, trying to get everything into my little carry on. And I, I stopped and I sat on the bed and I pulled him up beside me and I explained the situation that has, you know, gotten some of these children to fall behind and how eager they are to catch up. And I said, um, you know, I told him that the window during which these kids could develop a reading brain is narrowing. And I told him that if they weren't reached in time, that they'd never learned to find friends in books. And I said, wouldn't your life be boring and bleached if you hadn't found your friends in books, if you hadn't found, say, Harry Potter and Percy Jackson and I named a couple others, and uh, he nodded, and he, he slid off the bed, and he went back into his room, and I thought that was the end of it, and I kept packing. And then he came back uh, in a couple of minutes, and he gave me this. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Virgie. 
but it's on five dollars. It's half of his allowance. <laughs> so he said, more kids could find friends with books. Thomas, this like chubby, geeky kid, <laughs> as your example, and see if you can empower reading power so more kids can find friends in books. Thank you so much.